but it wasn't about what the hemispheres did. That was the old story. The left hemisphere does language, does reason, does whatever. The right hemisphere does emotion, whatever. This is not true. Both hemispheres are involved in pretty much everything. So what is the difference? The answer is it's in the how, not the what. Welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. We've made it to the end of Series 1. And just as we break through 20,000 listens and views, so thank you so much for all of your support. I really hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I've gone ahead and set up a Patreon account for anyone who's uh, been enjoying the show and wants to make a contribution to help me keep it all going. Um, Please, five-star rate us on iTunes too, guys, as that really, really helps get the show out to more more people who will like it. And we'll be back in late February with an incredible second series for 2022. I was blown away by the response from the guests I've been approaching. It's themed symbiosis and interdependence, and it includes some of the most brilliant minds of today, like David Chalmers on simulation theory and virtual reality. Antonio Damasio on thinking and feeling, Johan Hari on attention deficit, and Sue Blackmore's coming back again uh, to talk about free will, Philip Goff, the philosopher on a universe fine-tuned for life, and many, many, many more. So do please keep writing to me via the website with your constructive feedback, guest suggestions, and testimonials so I can just keep improving the content ongoing. Now, today, in this episode, we're going to be evaluating the evidence presented by psychiatrist and author Dr. Ian McGilchrist from his extensive analysis of split brain studies that support uh, a broader understanding of the mind and reality, one that can push beyond the traditional reductionist materialist worldview to include in some way the implicit, the context dependent and the consciousness dependent. Now, Ian has just released an epic two-part book to clarify all of this. It's called The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World, and in which he asks how we should understand consciousness, space, time, and matter, given the apparent overemphasis on left hemisphere interpretation of the world. Now, Ian is an associate fellow of the Green Templeton College in Oxford. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. He's a consultant emeritus of the Bethlehem and Maudsley Hospital in London and a former research fellow of the neuroimaging at Johns Hopkins University in uh, Baltimore. And he now lives on the Isle of Skye off the northwest coast of Scotland. He's published original research as well as original articles and papers in journals, including the British Journal of Psychiatry, Psychiatry and Psychology, the BMJ, the Lancet, the Wall Street Journal, the Sunday Telegraph and the Sunday Times on topics as broad as literature, medicine, psychiatry and philosophy. He's taken part in many radio and TV programs and documentaries, including for the BBC, NPR and ABC. And he's also taken part in a Canadian full-length feature film film about his work called The Divided Brain. Now, this interview was recorded at the start of last year, so the new book is not covered in so much detail. It's been fantastic, though, to hear in this first series from scientists and philosophers from all sides of the discussion, and we will continue to represent both sides of the camp so you listeners can make up your own minds based uh, on the evidence being presented. I myself don't tend to take a particular position because I just find as soon as I subscribe to one approach, it becomes one-sided and incomplete. So bearing all that in mind, let's go. So Dr. Ian McGilchrist, thank you so much for coming on Chasing Consciousness. Welcome and how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Freddie. Very nice to be with you again. Well, it's a great, great uh, honor to have such an experienced author with us. 
I always am fascinated, Ian, and I want to start here by the first questions and conundrums that scientists and philosophers and academics like yourself start thinking about when they're teenagers, and maybe even the ones that seem to be more important than the rest. What was it that first got you thinking really, really deeply? And perhaps you can tell the story of how those questions, as they evolved, led to each stage of education and specialization, because I just loved the way you had no qualms about just heading into years more of study in order to answer these 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 all important questions. Yes. I mean, often these stories sound um, very convincing in retrospect. Um, but at the time, you often have a mix of motives and you're not, you know, you're just led on to something without really knowing why. But I do remember very much in my teens, um, there were a couple of things that struck me. One was uh, I was surrounded by old surfaces, old buildings at school, um, some of them medieval, and um, by a rather beautiful natural landscape. And it struck me that the idea that all of this was somehow remote from my consciousness and inert didn't seem quite right. It struck me that there was something that was, as it were, in communication with me, and it was a two-way process. Um, I mean, that may sound hard to justify, but I think it can be, and it's taken me decades to see why that can be the case. Um, another was that um, I remember being very struck by this. The, the way in which we were thought to understand things was to take them apart. And I was against the idea that the whole is just the sum of the parts. And I wasn't really able to explain to my my colleagues why. Uh, they were, well, what's this magical thing that's added in? Of course, that... Um, supposes that you actually start from parts, whereas I believe you start from holes, in fact, and then take them apart and find none of the qualities in those separate parts that were together in the whole. And again, that can be fairly easily um, uh, not perhaps explained by, but but encompassed by uh, system theory and complexity and many things that are uh, scientifically respectable positions. And I suppose the third was just more an intuition, um, which was that things, uh, there was this idea that that things were linear, you know, that my life was linear, that the history of the West, which was the history I knew about, was linear, and that there was progress along this line. And I had this intuition that both in my thinking and in intellectual history and indeed in nature, that things develop in spirals, that it's not circles because that suggests you simply go round and round and don't go anywhere. But, of course, in a spiral, you, you're you constantly going somewhere, but you're doing it both in one line and by going round and round. And the spiral is a you know, basic image in... Um, the iconography of medicine, the, um, the the one, the caduceus with the, with the snake going around, and of course that's uh, in our own time been confirmed in the uh, or beautifully substantiated in the structure of DNA mm-hmm. as a double spiral, which was something actually the Egyptians thought that life was shaped like a double spiral. It's a very interesting point. Anyway, those were the intuitions. Um, there were probably a couple of others, but those were the main ones that led to my dissatisfaction with the the story I was being told was the right rational scientific story. So you started in literature um, at Oxford, but then some other questions arose for you. Yes. Well, I loved literature, um, and partly for that reason, I didn't want to go on studying it all my life because I didn't want to operate on my friends. But I um, I came to the conclusion that there were several things that were wrong with what we were doing. Uh, we took something which was embodied, was instantiated in the very words, not in a paraphrase of those words, a poem. 
Much as you take a piece of music, you can't paraphrase it or otherwise explain it. It exists in those notes. So one took this embodied being and turned it into something very abstract in one's discussion. Um, secondly, one took things out of context, and that was something that, starting again in my teens and then very much reinforced in my time in Oxford, looking at literature, struck me so forcibly that things are never understood out of a context, because when you put them out of a context, you change them. And if you put them in a new context, they look quite different. But what I, what I felt was that things had become disembodied, that they'd become uh, taken out of context, and the implicit, which needed to remain implicit, which is part of the same point, had to be made explicit. When we talked about it, we took something that was very subtly there in the meaning of the words and tried to make it visibly um, explicit in, in prose. And we lost somehow the uniqueness. How did those doubts lead you to feeling the need to study the science of the mind and the body? Well, it, it struck me that um, part of the problem here was the mind-body problem. That what we'd done is take something that was actually not just a mental construct, but was an embodied being, and destroyed its uniqueness, its implicit meaning, and its embodiedness. And I start, started studying the mind-body problem by going to philosophy seminars. But in short, they seemed much too disembodied in their approach to this question. <laughs> and I, I, I thought I ought, to, um, I, ought to, I ought to study medicine. Actually, I didn't know about Merleau-Ponty in those days because Oxford was very narrow, it didn't really talk about the continental tradition, the phenomenological philosophers. But as you know, Merleau-Ponty was a philosopher who also studied neurology in order to answer some of his own questions about embodiment. And without actually knowing about Merleau-Ponty, I did something of the same kind, because I thought in order to answer these questions, I need to be closer acquainted with what happens when something changes in somebody's mind and it alters their brain or their body, or something alters in their brain or their body and affects their mental world. And that meant studying medicine. So I did that, which, you know, took, took a long while. Did it go any way to answering those questions? Um, yes, it did. Uh, and it did in a way that I hadn't really anticipated. Um, because I got to know the work of... Um, a colleague, John Cutting, uh, who uh, I almost by accident went to a lecture one day, which changed my life. He had been uh, looking at what happens to people after right hemisphere damage. And it, this was unusual because most uh, physicians and psychiatrists were interested in what happened after left hemisphere damage because it did various very obvious things like make it hard to interact with the world with your right hand. Or, or to use language, and those both seem very fundamental. But in fact, they're only prominent, they're not fundamental. Um, they're prominent because we trip up over them. But the, to understand the fundamental nature of reality, uh, it's much more important to have a functioning right hemisphere. And that's what he had discovered, is that although it's more subtle than not being able to speak, when you have a right hemisphere stroke, your whole world, your experiential world changes. And that to me was utterly fascinating. And in, it answered the, the questions I'd been asking about um, literature in a very direct way, because in the course of an hour's lecture, uh, John mentioned a number of things, uh, 10 or 12 things that differentiated the right and left hemispheres. And one was that the right hemisphere understood implicit meaning, whereas the left hemisphere tended not to, tended to take things literally, not understand metaphor or humor. The second was that it was the right hemisphere was much more in touch with the embodiment of our being uh, in a number of respects, which I could take apart if we wanted, but just let's leave it at that for the moment. And that it also uh, understood the value of the unique, whereas the left hemisphere tend not to, tended not to see the uniqueness of something, but to have abstracted what placed it in a general category. It's got one of those, so I see, I put it in the box, which contains things that have one of those about them. So it tended to miss the uniqueness of the whole.
In other words, it took things apart. It saw parts, whereas the right hemisphere saw the whole. And literally, in the case of the body, the left hemisphere saw body parts, you know, an arm, an ear, a nose, but not the what we call the body image, which is a, a, a holistic sense of the body in, in all of our sensory modalities. So this led to the the seed of what became your best known work, um, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, which of course I uh, came about many years later after all of your experience in psychiatry. You began by delving deep into the data of years of split brain experiments to confirm once and for all what really are the differences between the left and right hemisphere. Um, and this, as I said, there was a reality that you came face to face with on a daily basis, working with with brain damaged patients. What did that research reveal? Obviously, a huge and and very detailed book. But perhaps you can just give us a little overview in terms of the differences between the left and the right that you gleaned from all of those different studies. And did it match your experience as a hospital psychiatrist? And did it fit with our popular conception that the left hemisphere is rational and the right hemisphere is intuitive and emotional, or, or is that just a desperate oversimplification? Well, it is, but I'll come to that. Um, what you see is partly a, a function of what model you use. And so if you've already got a model that the left and right hemisphere separate along the lines that you just alluded to, um, you would have tended to miss um, what I found. And the first thing I had to do was to put out of my mind all the preconceptions about right and left hemispheres. So one very frustrating thing for me is that I look at vast arrays of literature and things over um, a, a great range um, and re evaluate what it is we find but people think oh the right left hemisphere story that was debunked years ago well <laughs> what was debunked was simply the wrong story but there has to be a story you know the brain's divided in two why why are the two parts asymmetrical why is the connection the corpus callosum partly the agent of division rather than union it's very interesting what i found basically was that it wasn't about what the hemispheres did that was the old story the left hemisphere does language does reason does whatever the right hemisphere does emotion whatever this is not true both hemispheres are involved in pretty much everything um so what is the difference the answer is it's in the how, not the what. So in each of these cases, they adopted a different attitude or disposition towards the world, which revealed and enabled them to take in completely different aspects of experience. And if I were to sum it up, I'd say the left hemisphere's world is one in which certainty is prized and ambiguity, ambivalence or uncertainty is seen as a weakness and is hard to tolerate. So the left hemisphere is always looking for a cut and dried solution. It understands what is explicit, not what is implicit, as I mentioned. It therefore misses many of the nuances, which are the substance of the meaning of what we say and do. And it sees things as fundamentally isolated and the brain's task to see how they go together. So it puts things together whereas the right hemisphere sees that things are already seamlessly, inevitably interconnected, and that when you try and take something out of the web, uh, you drag it forcibly out, um, doing damage to the web on the way, um, and perhaps you can never really take anything out of context because the context is nothing less than the whole of everything else that exists. The left hemisphere sees um, things as um, measurable, quantifiable, the right hemisphere is more interested in the qualities, uh, brings you back to the notion of the different characteristics that make for uniqueness. The left hemisphere tends to the abstract, the right to the embodied, the left to the, um, if you like, the idea of something, and the right to the actual experience or presence of the thing. And that's probably one of the most important differences is between presence and representation, which literally means trying to make something present again, which is no longer present, it's in the past. 
it's re-presented. Now, that may sound like a small point, but it's absolutely central philosophically to understanding the important difference between the hemispheres. It's like the difference between the world and a map of the world or a schema of the world. The schema, the map, is very useful, but it's useful largely because it leaves almost everything that's in the reality out, and it just highlights certain aspects. But that's a representation of reality, the presencing of reality as it is experienced, as it comes into being for you and through you, through your attention to it, is a quite different thing from the representation. It's as though you were looking at a photograph album, and it's not that there's anything wrong with a photograph album, it records an aspect of reality. But you then were able to step out of the album into the real lived world of time and space in which what is recorded in that cliche, as the French call it, a snapshot, uh, exists. So those are some of the main differences, I'd say. And did that fit with all your experience in the hospitals with uh, brain damaged patients? Did you see a few examples that, that came back to mind as you were researching the book where you're like, oh, that reminds me of that patient who, uh, who said this or who did that or who struggled with that? Were there a few strong examples that made you think of your patients? Absolutely. There were many. Uh, and of course, once you start to put out of your mind the bad old model, as it were, you start seeing new things that other people hadn't uh, seen, except my colleague John Cutting. I suppose there were a couple of patients that stand out, um, or a couple of types of patient even, because these things happen repeatedly. But one thing that happens is that the left hemisphere is more interested in the inanimate and what can be uh, used and in parts of things. So in, in a way of bringing all those things together, I remember patients who got stuck on objects in the right visual field, which is what the left hemisphere takes care of. They had damage to the right hemisphere, and that meant that the left half of space didn't exist for them. Um, it's not a problem with the vision. It was a problem with attention. They wouldn't attend to the, the, the left hemisphere, only attend to the bit of space it can use, which is over there on the right, where your right hand is for grasping and getting. And so these, these patients would get fixated on something in the right visual field, which was inanimate uh, and was uh, of utility. So they'd fix on the knob on the end of a radiator that was over there on the wall, and they wouldn't be able to let go of it. Uh, or the, uh, I remember a patient who was very difficult to get him to go from one room to another because on his way through the door, he would start looking at the hinge and he would get completely fixated on this hinge. Trying to work out what it was for. Well, I think he knew what it was for, but somehow... There was, it wasn't a rational process. It wasn't a thinking process. It was a pre-conceptual uh, disposition of the left hemisphere to lock on to inanimate things that might be of use. If you, you know, saying that was he trying to work it out makes it think, seem much more like the way you or I would approach it. But I'm talking about something that is like a primary pre-conceptual phenomenon of the attention is drawn um, in that way. Now, there are a number of features to notice in this. One is that when you have, <coughs> excuse me, when you have left hemisphere damage, you don't have this phenomenon that half of space goes missing because the right hemisphere is interested in the whole of space. It's still working. So you don't get this, I'm only looking over there in reverse. You don't get that. Second thing is the inanimate is more of interest than the animate to the left hemisphere. Um, the animate more than the inanimate to the right hemisphere. The third thing is that it looks at a part of something, the knob on the radiator or the screw in the hinge or whatever it is, rather than the whole of what one, one is seeing here, a door frame or parts of the furniture of the room. How did that compare with patients with right hemisphere damage? Presumably there were some quite contrary uh, pathologies. Well, uh, I think you misspoke there. These were patients with right hemisphere damage. I think what you mean sorry, is what, yeah, sorry. what happened in left hemisphere. Damage. Yeah, you know, it's easy to do. I do it. I do it all the time. Um, <laughs> patients with left hemisphere damage don't see the world as inanimate. Tend to see the whole of things. For example, if asked to, if you make a, a drawing of an M 
that is made out of um, lots of little Zs. And you, you, you do that and you, you show it to a, a patient with left hemisphere damage and ask them to reproduce it. They just draw a big M. If you ask a patient with right hemisphere damage to draw the same figure, they'll draw just a heap of Zs on the floor without the overall shape. So the seeing of the overall shape or gestalt as it's called in psychology, just the German word for a sort of form or shape, um, is the, the province of the right hemisphere and the bits are the province of the left hemisphere. So all of this uh, was very intriguing and demonstrated a whole lot of things. Another thing that's very important is that the left hemisphere is less flexible. It tends to get stuck on an idea and won't let go of it. And sometimes I think dogmatic scientists and indeed dogmatic fundamentalists of any particular persuasion are a bit like this, very left hemisphere. It's like this, it's cut and dried, it's in the books, that's what it is, and I'm not opening my mind to anything and I can't be moved on from this position. Mm -hmm. And indeed, schizophrenia, which is a left hemisphere overdrive condition, one of the reasons it's very difficult for people to let go of a false belief is that they're absolutely stuck on it. There are many other aspects to that, actually, but it's one of them. Mm. And so detaching this person from something they've got locked onto is harder when they haven't got the right hemisphere, because the right hemisphere is taking different views, and it's saying, hang on, it might be like this, don't have to look at it like that. So there's both a kind of intellectual flexibility in the right hemisphere that there isn't in the left, but there's also, at a very basic physiological level, a stickiness of attention. So, for example, there's something called um, um, the attentional blink, which is that after you've seen something and clocked it, there's a tiny fraction of time, usually just a few thousandths of a second, before you can take in a new stimulus. But after right hemisphere damage, when you're relying on the left hemisphere, it's something like four times longer. So it gets fixated and it can't move on to something else. So those are all from, say, one or two patients who demonstrated it very graphically. I could give you another example, which I, I love, but is, and it's very common. I, I believe all medics have seen this, um, although they may not have focused on it at the time, which is the fact that the left hemisphere is a specialist in denial. It, if it doesn't know something, it always makes up that it does know something, for which reason Mike Gazzaniga calls it um, the narrator. It sort of makes up a story that makes sense of something, and it seems to believe it, even though there's no element of truth in it. I just wanted to say for the listeners that we've actually got a show both with Mike Gazzaniga and with Joseph Ledoux uh, talking all about this left-brain uh, interpreter, as they call it. May I finish finish with the patient. Or, or, oh, or, I was just going to say, this is a phenomenon that's very clear, and it's to do with denial. When an, a patient has um, something wrong, like a paralyzed arm, they will completely deny that there's anything wrong with it. And if asked to move it, they will claim they've moved it, but actually nothing has moved. And if you draw their attention to it and say, now move that, they'll say, well, that's not my arm. It belongs to the person in the next bed. It belongs to my mother. Or it's your hand, doctor. I mean, that, that's, these are recorded conversations that other people have reported, and I have seen them in practice, mm -hmm. that they will deny there's anything wrong and say it's not my responsibility, that this thing that isn't right has nothing to do with me because I'm always okay, according to the left hemisphere, which has a ridiculously idealized view of self. Absolutely. And this is why, listeners, I uh, really wanted to speak to Mike Zanager about, about the left brain interpreter that, that him and Joseph Ledoux uh, identified uh, in those early split brain uh, experiments when they did exactly what it is explaining. They, they just said, why did you do that? And they, I think my main concern with this phenomenon and why I felt it important in, to put it in this first series where we're talking about the limits of the mind and reason um, is that we are not, that's not a hypothesis. The mind believes that is categorically the reason why something has happened. And I think that there's a lot of, that's a very re revealing phenomenon about the way we stick to our intuitions about the why things are happening in the world and why we're seeing certain results in science. And so I think it's important that we bear that in mind going forward. And actually, that brings us quite nicely on to my next question. Again, we're still laying the 
we're, we're just laying the foundations before we get into speaking about pushing beyond these limits of physicalism. Um, it seems to me Ian, that scientism has a complete control of the Western narrative about the nature of existence at the moment. I think there are signs that that's changing, and I'm sure we'll get into that in a bit. But for the benefit of us, who you know, the listeners who may not have heard of the phrase, what exactly is scientism, and and how do we separate the healthy use of scientific method, which has done so much for our society? I mean, it's just incomparable. The world without science, I mean, we couldn't even identify, you know, recognize it. How do we separate the healthy use of that method from this sort of dogmatic reductionism of scientism that could be holding us back? Scientism is the failure to realize the proper bounds of science. Science is, a, as you say, a marvelous human thing. It's actually a work, you wouldn't think this from the way we're taught science, but it's actually a work of great imagination apart from anything else. Imagination is very important to scientists. If you read the story of many great discoveries by mathematicians and scientists, they practically all involve intuition and imagination. However, let that be. Uh, scientism is the belief that science can answer all our questions, um, which is a very naive, philosophically speaking. And it assumes that there are no assumptions in science, but there always are assumptions in science. Um, there are assumptions in everything. Uh, th there comes a point where your questioning of things has to stop, and you have to say, OK, this much I have to take for granted. Those are your basic axioms from which you build the structure. But it's always possible that your starting point may dictate your end point, that where you, the things that you've been relying on govern what it is that you find. And you also have to accept that there's much that goes beyond the sort of things that science can deal with. Science must deal with what is um, objectively reproducible and presentable to another person and what is measurable. But there are many very real aspects of our life, starting with consciousness and the experience of love and many other things, which we can talk about the brain correlates of for as many years as you like, but we never actually get near to understanding what is consciousness or love. And so how would you suggest, um, I mean, this obviously will be quite important in our next question, really, about how we tentatively step beyond those limits. But how would you suggest that we use the scientific method differently? Because if I've understood correctly, I feel that scientism, it's not only saying that science can explain every phenomena, but it's also saying that physical science so material science can explain every phenomena which seems to me a little um well reductionist because that's just one three-dimensional uh set of parameters that we have access to yes okay they are testable and uh reproducible in a way that other things like consciousness aren't but surely just to say because we can't test beyond that it doesn't exist is is that what scientism is claiming what I want is for science to be more scientific, not less. Mm. Um, and that comes from keeping the possibility that one may be missing something present in one's mind. And as soon as one does that, one starts to see a lot of phenomena one had been ruling out. Now, it is not scientific to say that everything must be explained by matter. That's just a prejudice. I mean, it's simply an opinion but it doesn't have any good grounds. In fact, it flies in the face of reason and experience, which suggests that there are things that are immaterial. And one big one is consciousness, which people have been trying to explain in material terms for a hundred years, and they haven't produced anything remotely plausible mm. for this. Mm. Um, and in the Oxford Handbook to Science, Ramachandran and Colin Blakemore, two great scientists, say we may have to accept that consciousness is one of, along with matter, is one of the founding principles or building blocks of the universe. A bit like John Wheeler it, saying that we are in, in a, a physicist, John Wheeler speaking about a participatory universe. It's like actually yeah. the mind matter uh, 
question really can't be solved as one or the other or one being primary to the other. It, it really is a participatory. It is both together, at least where we've got up to uh, at this stage. Ian, just before we go into that, because obviously that is the main conversation for today, um, I just wanted to quickly share something that I've noticed. And I wonder if this might not be part of the problem. I've noticed that science tends to not take notice of a new phenomena until there's a tested theory to explain it or until we actually start building technology based on it. Um, mm. And this seems really, really absurd because it's almost like a kind of cognitive dissonance. It's like, it's like until I actually understand something, it doesn't exist, which sounds like more of a phenomena of consciousness than of material science. Surely it's kind of odd because actually surely we would be doubly curious and respectful towards something that was outside of our current theories, um, rather than kind of dismissing it. Doesn't that seem a sort of double standard? Absolutely. And it comes back to what I was saying, that particularly if you're of the left hemisphere cast of mind, um, then you don't accept anything that you can't explain. The left hemisphere knows the answers to everything. That's what it believes, which is why it does what Mike Gazzaniga has so beautifully demonstrated, makes up stories that go along with what it believes rather than change in any way uh, what it believes, to take into account that actually it can't remember what it did yesterday. So it makes something up. Now, th th again, this is a left-right hemisphere difference. The left hemisphere wants to stick to its model at all costs. The right hemisphere is better at exploring. The left hemisphere is, the, and this is actually literally imaged in the hands. When, when you get frontal disturbances that liberate the, the hands from normal conscious control, the right hand starts randomly grasping things. It starts sort of picking at things and trying to take them, even trying to take a picture of a knob out of a picture, sort of grasping it. And the left hemisphere, the, the, sorry, the left hand, the right hemisphere's um, agent in the world, is exploring. It's constantly exploring. It's not grasping. Now, the, the right hemisphere's role is in a way to say, no, that may not be the full story. It inhibits one's certainty about things. And if you, if you are um, working with the left hemisphere, then that aspect, what Ramachandran calls the devil's advocate, is no longer present in your deliberations. So you just don't, what you don't, can't explain doesn't exist. And you literally hear people arguing. I mean, it, it, it really does astonish me that there can be people who hold down jobs in university departments of philosophy who claim that consciousness is an illusion. It's absolutely glorious. It's a perfect demonstration of the crassness of this kind of left hemisphere thinking. Mm. Because, of course, in order to have the idea, you have to have consciousness, and for it to be an illusion, it has to be something in the consciousness. That's what an illusion is. So, you know, it, 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 the one thing that we know for certain is that there is consciousness. Matter? Hmm. Matter is something I know because of my consciousness. I don't know that I know consciousness only because of matter, but I do know that I know matter only because of consciousness. It's an element in my consciousness that has special qualities. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think it is extraordinary that people will rule out something they don't understand, because it seems to me that the whole basis of science is to say, now here's something very interesting that doesn't, automatically fit into the boxes I've got. Perhaps I should be flexible enough to slightly rethink the boxes to accommodate it. And that's how our knowledge evolves. If we just say, no, can't be doing with it, then we're fixed and stuck, and our knowledge and our understanding don't evolve. And, and the universe get... is about evolution. That is its main drive, in my view. Anyway, sorry. No, no, Ian, it's, it's, it's exactly where we're about to, to go with this conversation. But just to give credit to Mike Gazzaniga and Joseph Ledoux, um, you know, they, they are materialists and they, they do describe everything in terms of matter. But what was so wonderful about our conversation was that they mentioned, both of them, that they felt that there was, you know, two very separate layers of existence here and that it was... Uh, it, absurd 
to say that consciousness didn't exist and that subjective experience had to be honored as a very, very important thing, but that we had to, to get away from this idea of correlates and, and direct causation. That Actually, what we're talking about is different layers of existence. And I rather liked Mike's way of speaking about this, where he spoke about the fact that there were just so many layers between the two that to try and connect them directly you know, you would really only be able to look at correlations and there would be actually no way of talking about any form of sort of intercausation. And he said that actually what we need to explore is the layers between and to try and get a language. He was, you know, again, brilliantly wise, I thought, to understand that language is the intermediary here, which is our ability to represent those things rather than necessary to know what they are in and of themselves, I thought was very good. So just just you know hats off to to mike and joseph ledoux for both oh, yeah. being able to maintain uh, uh you know obviously given their job in neuroscience and materialistic uh, worldview but having that humbleness just to admit that subjective experience was hugely important and also you know i really recommend to the listeners to listen to the joseph ledoux episode on emotions because in in that episode we we really talk about the need to treat those in treatment settings and psychiatric settings to treat those mental health issues in two different ways so we treat the physiology with medication and we treat the state of mind and the subjective experience with with other forms of appropriate therapy and i thought that was, it was great to hear that coming from neuroscientists i have great respect of course for mm. gazani and ledoux whose work has illuminated many things yeah. um if i appear to be being critical it's just that i'm critical of gazaniga's criticisms <laughs> i don't think he's understood <laughs> what i'm talking about and i'd just like to say before we move on that i agree up to point with everything that you reported gazaniga is saying there except that you said two quite separate levels and uh, what i'd like to say is that the problem is not about finding connections or causations because a thing and itself are not part of a chain of causation and my view is that matter is an aspect of consciousness and is not separate from consciousness at all so it doesn't have to, we don't have to find the connections mm, and we see will what become, i mean that leads, back to, to that leads to oh, wow yeah absolutely that leads to a kind of dualism uh, and I'm opposed to that kind of dualism. Anyway, there we go. Yeah. No, and this is exactly where we're about to go. So um, in one of your conclusions of the master and his emissary was that society's reduction of the world to these slowly, you know, solely material and mechanistic functions, it leaves, leaves out a huge part of the capacity of the human mind. And I feel that there's brewing the feeling in the scientific community, um, probably thanks to philosophy, but but even also, I think the increase in MRI studies and, and the issues that we haven't yet solved the problem of consciousness, which I think some people genuinely thought at the end of the 90s that thanks to MRI and, and that, that we would eventually be able to do that. Um, I think there is brewing in the scientific community this idea that consciousness has a bigger role to play uh, in the nature of reality that it's being given credit for. Um, but sadly, you know, and understandably, few scientists are brave, brave enough to just come out and say that publicly. It's more the philosophers. Um, I'm keen to explore for the listeners uh, a way of sort of shaking off this taboo. And, and I'm just asking, Ian, if you could lay out in your mind some of the reasons, some of the, I mean, you know, I, I don't like sometimes this word argumentation because it sounds confrontational, but some of the reasons that you think could make up a post-materialist science or a post-materialist worldview that can hold with the values of us coming from a, a sort of logical, secular, evidence-based education, where in order to go into that with confidence, we're really going to need to feel that that's been satisfied. Could you just lay out a few of those arguments, a few of those points, and sort of, sort of tenderly encourage those who might be, like myself, very much in the middle? And on this podcast, we will be exploring all possibilities. We're going to be, I'm a big fan of Sue Blackmore. We're going to be talking to Sue Blackmore about her arguments. Even she goes even further than Dan Dennett and believes that free will is an illusion. You know, I'm going to be talking about this because I'm open. You know, she has had non-dual uh, 
experiences, something we're talking about now, about going beyond dualism. I believe that that, that there are all kinds of possible explanations. So let's just explore a couple of things that could just slowly edge us past this physicalist kind of dogma. Well, I'm glad you came back to physicalist because I have no axe to grind with the scientific method. Uh, you, you, you asked me whether or not you know I could accommodate um, what I have to say with the scientific way of looking at things, and my, my argument is absolutely yes. That, that my problem is with current science not being scientific. That is the point. So um, to look at the the way I look at things in terms of going beyond the, the mechanistic is that. Until the early part of the 20th century, we thought we had got physics licked. You know, famously, it was said we just got to put a few places after the decimal point and we've got there. And then suddenly, the world was turned upside down by quantum mechanics and later by quantum field theory. Um, so uh, it's been common knowledge in physics for over 100 years that you can't just approach reality using a mechanistic model. Um, now, that's not to say that mechanistic models have no place. You know, when I'm making um, a table or, you know, mending a window frame, then mechanistic models are fine. And Newtonian physics works perfectly for me. Um, one way I put it is this, that when, you know, the, the earth is round, but when I come to build a garage, I don't really need to take that into account. Um, but it's not that where I am, the earth is no longer round. It's still round. It's round everywhere. And the way Newtonian mechanics and quantum theory relate is similar. That for many purposes, in a, if you narrow your focus enough, Newtonian mechanics works very well. If you go to the smaller or the bigger, it no longer works. But it's not that, as it were, Newtonian mechanics works in the middle of the field and quantum mechanics works at the ends of the field. It's that quantum mechanics, unlike Newtonian mechanics, works everywhere. It's just that we can overlay an approximation for most purposes of the practical nature uh, in the middle of that field. Now, that's that may help, I hope, uh, people to understand that we need to sophisticate our model of the world, not just in physics, but in biology, in such a way that we don't have to um, throw out of the window um, what can be achieved by using a me mechanical model. What I'm interested in is including the current model in a bigger, broader, more generous, and more fruitful model, not doing away with it and saying it's rubbish. Um, after all, people could say, well, you may think the mechanistic model is wrong, but I would say it's achieved a lot of great things, to which I say absolutely correct. But that doesn't mean to say that the world actually is a mechanism. It just means that thinking of it as a mechanism for certain purposes works very well. So um, if, you, if you look at a biological system, an organism, it depends at what scale you look at it, what you see. If you look at it as a whole, you see a massively complex system of a kind that we know not only cannot, um, cannot its, its movements and its outcomes cannot be predicted, not just because we don't know enough, but because that is the nature of such a system, that it simply cannot be predicted. And such systems are very, very common in in the world. That most most systems are of this kind. Mm. Um, the very uh, you can imagine a very simple one is simply a double pendulum, a pendulum that swings from the bottom of another pendulum. You can't get easier than that. But it actually is an unpredictable, unstable phenomenon. Mm. So um, when we're looking at something like an organism, if we narrow down to a tiny, you know, just a few microns, uh, we can see some little tiny thing happening, a mechanism, and this thing pushes that. And I say, I want to intervene in that so I can invent a molecular way in which I can go in and intervene, and that will work. And then you go, aha, you see, I treated it like machine, and I've got an outcome. But that, 
it's a mistake to go from that to say, but the thing is a machine. It isn't. I mean, I can treat you um, as all sorts of things that would work um, ultimately uh, perfectly well, depending on what my purpose is. For example, treating you as um, a subhuman robot uh, would work very well if my task was to shovel you into the gas chambers. But it doesn't actually mean that you are a non-human robot. Thinking of things in a certain way is very efficient, but it doesn't mean it's true. So what I would say is that we need to catch up in biology uh, very badly on what has been happening in physics for 100 years. And I'm not sure why people like Dawkins and Dennett are simply stuck in a mid-19th century mechanistic mindset, the great age of the hydraulic machine, and haven't been able to see that, like, you know, everything in the inanimate, supposedly inanimate world, um, it's bound up with consciousness, consists of non reproducible and non-predictable paths overall. I mean, we can see patterns and generally say, there's a very good chance that this will happen, but it's not in any detail predictable. Weather, for example, I can give you quite a good idea, even on sky, of what it's going to do in an hour's time. But in two days' time, I've no idea at all. That's not because I don't know enough about the weather. It's because weather is intrinsically such a complex system that it can't be utterly predicted. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is break away from the mindset that what we're doing is achieving certainty after certainty by taking steps. And one thing I love is that um, George Gaylord Simpson, who is one of the founders of the modern synthesis, which is the way in which we generally understand molecular genetics, um, has said that, and he's absolutely right, that relatively few scientific discoveries were ever made according to the much fabled scientific method. Very often they were made by a mixture of imagination, serendipity, and intelligent use of data, rather than just grinding your way mechanically through things in the way that a computer would. Hmm. Ian, I think this is a good place to take a short break. Um, this has been a very good sort of introduction to some of the, the more detailed arguments and examples of where mind really is fundamentally involved in the way we measure the, the, the universe. And not just that, but also moving beyond this idea of a three-dimensional universe, uh, when we start to look at time and space as numinations uh, with great flexibility, rather than the sort of solidness that we're inheriting from our, our Newtonian past. Um, thank you so much, Ian, for this brilliant first part. Listeners, please do come back uh, and listen to part two, because we're not only going to be going into much more detail about the arguments to bring us over this threshold of physicalism into a, a broader, more open-minded science that's really going to free up a whole bunch of stuff that we need to experiment, we need to look at, and we need the full collaboration of scientific institutions to help us do that. Um, we're also going to be uh, looking in, uh, talking a little bit about, without giving anything away, uh, Ian's new book, The Matter with Things, and getting right into all of that. We're going to be also talking about another of his books um, about ways of attending, about the, uh, the importance of the way we attend to things. We're going to be looking at the possibility that we might be in the middle of a bit of a crisis, uh, a crisis of meaning and understanding that wonderfully, uh, as we've seen so many times in history, is actually a catalyst for change and for transformation, which I think is always a good thing. So there's lots more to, to come up in part two. So do please stay with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Everybody and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness to part two of this interview with Dr. Ian McGilchrist about navigating beyond materialism. So in part one, if you haven't heard it, you must go back and check it out. We spoke about Ian's deep, deep work in the analysis of all of the split brain data in his important book, The Master and His Emissary. 
Um, and we spoke about some of the implications of all of that for the way that we see the world and the potentially the way we stick slightly too solidly to explanations that maybe actually the evidence isn't fully there for. And just at the end of part one, we were really getting into the sort of tools, the argumentations, the important things we need to notice actually in material science um, that can sort of invite us to try and step beyond the frontiers of a purely material uh, science and a purely material worldview and start to include, I think most importantly, Ian, uh, consciousness. Maybe we could start there. You touched on it when we were you were talking about sort of the first quantum physicists really how, realizing how important the observer was. Welcome back, Ian. There are a number of things in our understanding of physics, contemporary understanding of physics, that suggests that it is impossible to limit the world to the material, purely material world, unless, of course, we redefine matter to include consciousness and spirit, in which case we've sort of done a sleight of hand. But but if, if not, um, a couple of things are clear from modern science. One is the, as you say, the observer effect, the, 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 the idea that uh, the fact of being observed or being somehow engaged by a consciousness seems to change what it is that is being engaged with. And there's also the phenomenon of entanglement, which I think is very interesting because, um, as you know, elements that are far too far separated in the universe can display entanglement. When I say too far, it means that no message could get from one to the other instantaneously um, because there's a limit of the speed of, of light. Um, and it would need to be many times the speed of light for this to be the case. Now, it seems to me that viewed entirely rationally, the only thing that can explain how two things always change together is that they're not two separate things, that they're part of the same thing. And I sometimes give the image of one of those uh, bistable percepts, they're called, those optical illusions in which you see either a vase or you see the two faces, you know, the sort of thing. And there's one of, do you see the young woman? Do you see the old lady? And it's not that, as it were, you see something that's a feather and you go, that's a hat, that's a young woman, or whatever. You... You can't see them both, but you go from one to the other completely seamlessly. There's one of a, of a flower and a butterfly, and then if you look at it another way, it's a human face. But you don't go butterflies and nose, and that makes the flower into an ear or whatever it is. It immediately becomes the other thing, and their, their immediacy is because they are actually the same thing. What is changing is not something out there, but something in our consciousness. So from a purely rationalistic point of view, those are interesting. From another uh, aspect of um, science rather than philosophy is the way in which the world changes depending on what we know and what we bring to it. So quite literally what you experience in the world, what seems to be there, what is there for you, um, changes depending on your attention. So consciousness is very fundamental uh, in a scientific way, but also when you start to think about the origins of consciousness, it seems to me that you come quite rationally to a position that consciousness cannot simply emerge from matter. Galen Strawson talking about this, this extraordinary, you know, if we're to say that it emerged out of uh, unconscious matter, we need this sort of magical jump. And Strawson kind of finds that far less uh, logical and scientific uh, uh, an idea of this sort of magic I don't know, um, change, this jump from unconsciousness to consciousness, he's saying, listen, actually, it's far more logical to say that, that there was some seed of consciousness from the start. Is that something that you would, you would agree with? No, I do indeed. Um, there's now quite a movement, even in the world of Anglo-American analytic philosophy, to which, broadly speaking, Galen Strawson belongs, and Christian de Quincey in I think California, 
but now that, that spread out from there to really quite a quite a school um, of thinking about consciousness, which is that it can't simply emerge from matter, but must be, as it were, there from the beginning. So uh, that that uh, seems to me n not, as it were, a fanciful or um, irrational idea. It's no more fanciful or irrational than the idea that consciousness just somehow emerges from there's a moment when there is no consciousness and then there is a moment when there is consciousness i mean that that's that's no more easy to swallow than the idea that there is consciousness there from the start in fact it's less logical so uh, and then of course there are many arguments around that which we could spend hours and hours talking about but i'm assuming well i don't know if you want to go into defending that position but i have done in talks on the internet several times in the last year you think that it's useful to listeners who may be coming to this for the first time you know i'm very aware uh, that i myself you know, quite recently when I came across this research, I hadn't really sort of thought about it. I really hadn't considered it. So if you think that there's some some important things to mention in that, that that could help us, I mean, personally for me, just what you've just mentioned, it's just the very fact that it's more logical to think of some 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 seed of consciousness, some building block, some basic thing, which is what sort of integrated information theory, which we'll be covering in the second series, is talking about. Um, being there from the beginning and slowly building up in complexity, quite similar to evolution in matter. Um, it makes so much more sense scientifically looking at our, our history of, of scientific thinking about evolution rather than this idea of this spark. That sounds much more sort of, well, pseudo-religious to think that there was some kind of intervention, some kind of spark that, that led to this jump from inanimate matter to, 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 to matter with consciousness. Is there anything to add to that? I mean, obviously, we don't necessarily need to dip, to go into defending it, but are there are there any other sort of because I'm interested in there may be some actual phenomena that we can look at in the physical world that support that kind of thinking. Well, if you're asking, is it possible to see consciousness in what we would normally consider inanimate objects? And there is no way that that can be proved. In essence, we're in an area in consciousness where it's not a matter uh, that can be demonstrated. It is a matter of coming up with a, a more satisfactory scheme of things which explains more and contains more than the schema or the gestalt with which we've been operating up till now. Um, but there are, I mean, as I say, it seems to me striking that we assume matter is prior to consciousness when you consider that, as I say, it is a fact that I only experience matter through, through the fact that I have consciousness. I don't know that I only experience consciousness through the fact that there is matter, my brain. I, that may be the case or it may not, but it's not logical to assume the other. There's also a kind of... Um, uh, Anthropomorphism in reverse operates. Um, you, you know, um, well, inanimate objects don't look like they do the sort of things I do with my consciousness. So there the can't be consciousness in what we consider to be inanimate matter. But that is to commit, as it were, the anthropomorphic um, uh, fallacy uh, in reverse. Uh, normally, the, the, the fallacy is um, we, we make things look more like it, we, we see the human in them. But here is we, we're enabled to see uh, the human in them, and therefore we dismiss that aspect. So, um, but but uh, I think when we come to talk about all the things that really matter to us, the things like time, space. Um, and at much more important level, things like beauty, um, love, and truth. These things can't be found in the material world. They, they, they can be found operating on and in and out of the material world, but they can't be measured in a lab. And so to limit yourself to material things that can be measured in the lab is irrational. Whereas what we're talking about are things that are not within the schema of ordinary rationality, but they're not irrational. They're supra-rational or trans-rational. For example, music. We know, we absolutely know that music uh, 
can communicate to us many powerful things that we can't see, measure, or detect, but it definitely does them. And it's not irrational to believe that music is doing that. It's just that we have to sometimes say, well, my normal rationalizing mind is either assuming something too much at the start or is going wrong in the process of building on that. Mm -hmm. Because if it's going to dismiss that music exists or music has meaning or anything like that, then there's a failing in the philosophical structure that's being used to approach it. And it seems to me that if the plan you're following takes you to the wrong place, it's logical not to carry on going and just going, well, I know this is the right direction we've got to go on, but to think, hmm, maybe there's something wrong with this plan. Let me retrace a bit and see where else I might go. Mm. And so how, I mean, I'm just thinking now about this idea of panpsychism, which definitely in the second series we're going to be uh, we're going to be explaining as a philosophical position in much more depth, because as, as Ian says, it's really gaining in popularity at the moment. For these very clear logical reasons that it seems sort of more reasonable to think that it's it's present from the start in the evolution of matter but you once said to me Ian, you said i'm much more than a panpsychist i wonder I, i'm going obviously i'm going to ask you to explain that but I, I i wonder if there isn't something here about this idea because panpsychism holds that consciousness is primary to matter. It's fundamental to the existence of matter. And I wonder if that might not be part of the problem, this idea of thinking of something being primary to something else, and that actually it would be more logical to think of this in a non-dual sense and to say that the two arise together. What are your, what's your take on that? Is that something to do with the way you say that you're more than a panpsychist, or is that a separate point? Well, I'm sympathetic to a Buddhist position, which you've virtually described uh, that matter and consciousness co-arise. Uh, I believe this concept of co-arising is everywhere in the cosmos, that it isn't just a linear sequence, this happens, it makes that happen, that makes something else happen, but things come into being together, um, not one first influencing the other and the other then influencing the one, but both actually simultaneously forming into what they are and they wouldn't have done without the presence of the other factor, if you see what I mean. So I see matter and consciousness like that. And one way that I put it that I think works um, for me is the idea of water. Now, water can be transparent, completely pliable, constantly flowing. It can be absolutely rock solid, opaque, hard enough to split your head open, ice. Or it can be such that you simply can't see it at all um, when it's in the atmosphere. So water has a number of phases, as chemists would say. And if I were to say, well, which is the primary one? One would be tempted to say, well, water, because it's the one we're more familiar with. Water is the flowing water. But water is also ice and is also steam. So... What I, what I would suggest is that I'm happy with people saying consciousness and matter arise together. And when we say consciousness is just primary, what we might be thinking is that it's easiest to think of the foundational state of water being the flowing one and that the others as being special cases of it. But I don't mind how you, how you think of it, but I think the important thing is to recognize that Consciousness is part of it from the very outset, not something that simply arises. Now, I, I don't know if you want me to talk about this, but there are a number of things in biology that suggest that there are form fields. And this shouldn't be very surprising, because in physics there are form fields. In fact, matter, which... One of the, one of the things that one has to remember is that the appeal of materialism, of reductive materialism, is that at least we understand matter. So let's work from the thing we understand towards something that's less easy to understand, consciousness. But quantum but actually, contradicts that. It says that matter isn't at all the way we see it. 
Exactly. Modern physics says that matter is extremely complex and difficult. And there is a problem in explaining matter that is just as great as the problem in explaining consciousness. So um, it's usually people who are not physicists who approach this thing. I'm being really hard nosed here. I'm reducing it all to matter. But the physicists, as Adam Frank, a physicist in New York, says, when people say that to physicists, they look a bit sheepish and um, look at their f- feet and mutter, yes, it's all very complicated. So, uh, uh, you know, I just don't think that uh, the idea that consciousness arises is a very sensible or rational one. And I'm, I'm certainly not advising that we give up on reason, although rather like science, there may be limits to it. In fact, there are limits to reason. And um, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time and great rational thinkers was Pascal. And he said that, you know, Uh, if reason can't get as far as arguing to its own limits, it's having a, having limits, then it's feeble. Uh, and he also said somewhere else, two excesses, to admit nothing but reason and not to admit reason. So we need to have reason in our arsenal. We need to have science in our arsenal. We get nowhere without them. But we also need imagination and intuition. Each of these is important. Each of them has a special role in that it can do something that the others can't do. And ideally, when we're approaching a question, we would use as many of these as appear to have an application in that area. Whereas I argue that at the moment, we use really only one or two, perhaps. And even then, we use them in their less productive way, in their less productive mode. For example, both science and reason have, as I argue in my new book, left hemisphere and right hemisphere manifestations. So that um, as many scientists have pointed out, and I said this, the way in which we come to conclusions is not by a rote business of taking all the possible hypotheses and proving them by a laborious scientific method to be wrong. We select things that we have a hunch may very well be helpful. And we evaluate those, often only coming to our conclusions after some piece of evidence falls into place. Sometimes we can see that this is the case. Many physicists and mathematicians and other scientists have described this in their own work. We can see that something is the case before we're able to explain it. Only afterwards can we explain it. Famously, Einstein was like this, but many, many mathematicians and scientists have been like this. And the other one is reason. You see, reason, there are two ways of thinking of reason. Reason is a kind of rationalizing uh, logical mechanism which could be best done by a computer. Reason is something that a computer could never do, is another way of thinking of it. It's the ability to synthesize a vast body of experience and the information we gather from experience with that rationalizing process to reach a much more profound assessment of what we're looking at. And when we're looking at anything that really exists, rather than something that's just a fantasy in the abstractions of our mind. That second kind of reason is very important. Mm. It involves understanding metaphor. It involves having imagination. It involves paying attention to intuitions, but never allowing any of these factors to rule completely over the others. Can we come back to biology for a moment there? Because you, you know, we got distracted thinking about Einstein and 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 the matter as energy thing, but but it's true that that biology is also starting to understand things much more in sense of fields. You had a few examples you wanted to mention there. Well, some are very interesting. Barbara McClintock, who won a Nobel Prize in the nineties, I think, um, for her work in molecular biology noticed that there were various things that organisms did that she could only describe as intelligent, by which she meant that they addressed a problem with a new solution that they couldn't have been programmed for and couldn't ever experience previously. And to make that, uh, there she was looking at single-celled organisms who would have something devastating happen to them that she could engineer in the lab, and they would adapt and survive in ways that if they'd had to wait simply for entirely random chance to get them there, they couldn't have done it. Mm. 
Another example, um, you can, using um, microsurgical techniques, you can remove the flagellum from certain um, single cell organisms, which is essential to their existence. And they can regrow a flagellum within a period of four days. Now, I was staggered when I heard that, um, because we don't know quite how that is done. Also, flies were bred without a certain gene, which is essential for the formation of eyes, um, PAC6. And it's, it's responsible for many kinds of eyes. Most people in you know, school biology remember that there are compound eyes such as flies have, and there's flies that a frog, the eyes that a frog has, or eyes, human eyes, and, and they work on different bases and they have quite different structures. But the, the same gene, PAC6, generates all of these in the context of the whole organism. Now, that's a very important finding about, I'll just digress for a second, that's a very important finding about how genes work. Genes don't just program blindly for a certain thing. For one thing, there aren't enough genes to account for all the things <laughs> that actually are constantly being produced by cells. They, they respond to the environment and the cell is more active than the genome. One very good analogy is that the genome is like a store place, a store that the cell can go to to find what it needs. But the cell has an intelligent response. Um, James Shapiro um, at, I think, the University of New York uh, says that all living things right down to the single organism exhibit intelligence. Brian Ford, another um, uh, scientist in the same area, said the same thing. But anyway, to come back to this business of the flies in the eyes, you can breed flies that don't have pack six. And guess what? They don't have eyes. Um, and then you breed them amongst themselves and they don't have eyes. And after 14 generations, they start to have eyes again. Mm. Now, that's without the gene that is apparently essential for the creation of eyes. Now, if this were to occur simply by random action, it would take, well, thousands of years, possibly longer. So what a lot of biologists are coming round to is not that there is some, you know, divine engineer who's going, well, I think we'll do that, but that actually evolution is far more complicated than that. And indeed, Darwin himself said, you know, it can't be an entirely random process. This doesn't involve any kind of sleight of hand. If you think of water falling on a landscape, it can fall anywhere on a landscape. And for a while, it may burst the banks of existing rivers and take unusual paths. But in the end, it will tend to come down to the same mouth at the bottom of the valley and go into the sea. So nobody was directing the water drops. They just happened to fall anywhere. But there was in the landscape a potential which guided things towards certain outcomes. We see this everywhere in biology. So the idea that there are guiding forms that an organism tends to stick to. I mean, for example, a tree, very interesting phenomenon. A tree has a very beautiful shape, which no creature that the tree requires for its existence could appreciate. Um, the tree requires all kinds of microorganisms to live, but they wouldn't go, my goodness, that oak tree has a very beautiful shape. But all oak trees have a similar, very pleasing shape. How does the oak tree deliver that shape? I think the answer is we just don't know. But if you disturb the shape of a tree or many kinds of organisms, they will regain that shape. Now, is that actually in a string of code? It seems it is not. And actually nothing in the genome is like a code in various ways. First of all, it's three-dimensional. Um, secondly, as I've said, bits of code code for many different things depending on the context. And uh, apart from all of that, um, it's impossible to imagine a machine that generates its own instructions for making itself. You can't start uh, with a machine that actually first has as its output the instructions for making the machine. But that seems to be the case with living organisms. And there are about um, uh, somewhere between eight and a dozen 
depending on how you carve up the territory, different aspects of organisms which make them completely different from machines. Mm. And it's just because we're familiar with machines that we think things must be mechanical, much as because we think we're familiar with matter that we account for the universe as simply made of matter, because, phew, I know what matter is. Because we've been familiar in the last 150 or 300 years in making machines, we start to think that the world is made like a machine, but it isn't. I imagine all of this comes into play in your new book, uh, The Matter With Things. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're arguing in the book, Um I really want to get on to meaning and uh, potential crisis. So just briefly, Ian, without giving too much away, what's it all about? Well, in, in, in a sentence or two, it's my best attempt to deal comprehensively with what I consider to be one of the blights of humankind nowadays, which is the reductive materialist mindset. Mm -hmm. I believe that the philosophy behind it is far from being robust, far from being sophisticated. I think it's very naive. And I think not only that, um, it is actually immoral, not just amoral, but has pernicious outcomes for us and for the world. And that it's helping us to destroy the world and to commit suicide as a species gosh no just a, just a just a little pamphlet then no no <laughs> it seems like an enormous undertaking yeah that that explains the the very great length of it which i don't know i don't think anyone knows what's going to happen to it at the moment it's according to my editor the equivalent of three books of 750 pages each so i don't quite know but it is a single overarching argument which i can hint at um in well, it, in broad outline that was the first beautifully explained in in those few sentences in and, and it's very much the subject of what we're talking about today in is there uh, a date do we know when we can get hold of a copy of this or is it too early to say in the editing process unfortunately it's too early to know what will happen to this manuscript because it is obviously a challenge for anyone i'm sure it can be seen that it's best published as a single item, but it's a very difficult thing to do, just practically. Mm -hmm. However, it is a single overarching argument that begins from studying the brain and works towards the structure of the universe, mm -hmm. the building blocks of the cosmos and the nature of the cosmos. So it, it is a, a, a comprehensive work. It's really the sort of thing that people did produce in the past when publishing was much easier. I mean, a lot of the philosophers that I read from the 18th and 19th century um, were able to publish philosophy in many, many volumes, but in a way this would require it. Mm. Um, I don't know when it will appear or in what form it will appear, or even if it will be called The Matter With Things. Uh, I like the title because, of course, it's a pun on several letter, but le levels about the problem with matter, the problem with things, and the problem with the way we are now. Absolutely. That, such relevant, relevant, relevant themes as well. Ian, is, do you mind if we move on? Because I, I have a few things I'd really like to touch on in the last half an hour. Sure, sure. Sure, of course. So the short book, Divided Brain and the Search for Meaning, um, to some extent, an abridged version of The Master and His Emissary for those of you who just don't have the time to read the full volume and get all the full detail. You confront this fact that despite our enormous increase in material wealth and well-being during the past few hundred years, there seems to be a distinct drop in happiness. What's your theory on this and, and how do you explain it sort of connecting to the left hemisphere data? What I relate it to is in the way in which we dismiss what our right hemisphere would tell us and is telling us, but we're not attending to it because it's much harder to articulate. It's money for old rope articulating the mechanistic position, but actually listening to things that go, no, it's more complex than that. It's going to be hard to explain, but I think I can do so, is more difficult. And what the left hemisphere enables us to do is very simply to use the world, to grab stuff for food, to build shelter, to materially thrive. 
What the right hemisphere does is to understand very much more. The left hemisphere's understanding is very limited and it doesn't even know what it is it doesn't know, which is a very bad place to start from. Uh, it thinks it knows everything. And we know from research on human beings that um, people who think they know everything are the stupidest people and people who really know a great deal think they know nothing. So uh, the left hemisphere is like, like a person who feels they know everything but really doesn't get it. The right hemisphere would tell us many, many things that are essential to happiness, such as that it doesn't come from simply indulging ourselves in pleasure, but of being a living member of a community of other living human beings and other living beings that are not human. So our relationships with one another in society, our relationships with nature, a word I very much prefer to the environment, which is sounds very technical and detached, like something around me, whereas nature is something that is me and I am in it, and we'll go back into it at the end of the day. So uh, our relations with one another in society, our relations with the natural world, and our a relation with something that may cause a problem for some listeners, the sacred. I just think that it's a huge blind spot to miss this out. Humanity everywhere and all times has, in various ways, um, largely accepting that it's very hard to express a sense of something that is greater than what we know. And that's not irrational. It would be actually quite irrational to suppose that we knew everything and we could perceive everything that was going on in the cosmos. And simply having the humility to accept that there are things that not only we do not know now, but we may not actually be equipped uh, to know, is, seems to be rather essential. After all, you know, a mouse doesn't know things that we know. Evolution is a process whereby uh, knowledge of things changes. Why do we think that we've reached the pinnacle of evolution? There may be very much that if evolution is allowed to continue, will become apparent because we have changed and grown faculties that we don't currently have. So that's a long way around of saying something that there is a staggering amount of evidence for. These three propositions, that health, mental health and physical health depends on social connectivity. This is something I touched on in the Master and His Emissary. And we're definitely covering it on the show. We're doing a whole show about the importance of connection in new psychological models. Yeah, so look out for that, listeners. Good. There is also a massive evidence, ever increasing, that our connection with the natural world, just being open to it and present in it, is vital for not just our mental health, but our physical health, reduces levels of many diseases that are not due to taking exercise, they're due to being present in nature as being part of a community, can affect cancer, blood pressure, whatever, uh, in ways that are nothing to do actually with um, taking exercise. They outdo, they're greater than the effects of smoking um, or not smoking and going to the gym and so on. on disease across the 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 um uh, across the field and the third thing and this is just as robust and when i discovered the evidence i was astonished because even i didn't think this could be the case um that being open to the idea of a, a sacred realm of the divine not only has um, psychological benefits that people could say well yes i mean uh, it would, wouldn't it? But it does. Um, it produces people who are happier, more fulfilled, more balanced, less neurotic, better able to make decisions, less selfish, all kinds of things. Um, it also astonishingly lowers levels of disease, uh, just like the other two, um, and produces healthy outcomes in mind and body. So if we live in an era, as I believe we do, in which we've become increasingly isolated from one another, increasingly selfish about me, me, it's what I want, what I do is what matters, not what society needs, what the planet needs. Um, if we are living in a world where we suddenly are absent from the natural realm, which until perhaps... 200 years ago, 99% of people in the world would have li lived in close communion with, and now perhaps less than half do. And if we live in a world, certainly the Western world, which has lost 
I think, any useful way to the divine, substituting fundamental creeds that are, in my view, a sort of distortion of our ability to understand or contact that that realm of the divine, mm. then it's hardly surprising that rates of mental illness are going up, and they are very dramatically. Mm. And I covered some of that in The Martian's Emissary. But there is other really more striking evidence that I'd just like to mention, if I may. One is the evidence of an American psychologist called Jean Twenge, and one of the problems in seeing how people are happy over time is knowing whether you're really assessing the same thing and whether or not awareness has changed. Um, and, for example, we identify things more now because we're looking for them, whereas in the past we didn't. So what Jean Twenge did was take data that were taken at the time going back to the 1930s. So people were asked an array of questions about the way they felt, how they experienced the world, what they thought. And those data were simply recorded, their objective accounts of how people's um, happiness was at that point in history. And then he, she's compared it decade by decade up to the present. And now she finds that young people are five to eight times more unhappy or depressed than they were in the 1930s. And that that kind of research gets around the idea of identifying it now more than in the past, because you're using the data from the, those, era, those eras, and you're asking the same questions. So that is absolutely fascinating in itself. It's brilliant research and something I definitely need to look into on the show. The only thing that I um, sort of balk at, and I'm sure many of the listeners uh, have a similar instinct given our education is this this concept of the sacred um i also um facilita facilitate dance meditations and as a result you know i'm pretty active in the well-being community in the in the new age community and uh one of the reasons we're doing this podcast i'm doing this podcast is is that i really feel the need to to demystify, to, to try and clarify exactly what we mean by certain of the concepts that have been sometimes hijacked by the new age and, and sort of oversimplified for the sake of of creating a, a, a sort of tool, as it were, for well-being. And, and I'm, I'm all for it, but I just feel that it's important coming from a, from a, a, a scientific paradigm that it's important that we need to, to clarify what we mean by certain things. So I'd like to unpack this word sacred, if you, if you don't mind. M my main uh, question here is, I suppose, how you see that? Because I think the main concern of, um, of, of atheists and, and ag agnostics in this looking at this idea of the sacred is that we would delude ourselves. So we want to be really, really sure that any ideas we entertain in the scientific realm um, in the realm of research and proposals by thinkers and academics is something that we could go away and sort of test how, how real it is. Um, now, obviously, <laughs> everything we've been talking about today is is difficult to do that, you know, when we come past these limits of, of uh, testing matter in a repeatable way at a local level, a, a sort of Newtonian level. We do have problems with that. However, I think the definition here of sacred, so would you agree that it, this idea that you mentioned there is related to that humility in front, in the face of the unknown? So quite similar to the argument I was giving saying, listen, this three-dimensional uh, dimension that we call the universe in space and time has been shown to be, in fact, matter, if we go down to a fundamental level, uh, has been shown to be energy at a fundamental le level, thanks to Einstein. It's also been shown to be uh, at least observer interdependent, if not observer dependent, because of quantum physics. Uh, it's been shown to, to be non-local in, in terms of entanglement. So we've got all this evidence that's pushing us to, to the fact that there's more beyond that single three-dimensional dimension. But I, I am, I, I bulk when I start saying, ah, what that is, is divine. What that is, is sacred. So for me, this word of sacred is not by any means invalid, but it's about a humility. It's about saying, listen, we can see the intelligence in, you know, in and of itself in the system. 
Uh, you mentioned it even in a non-DNA related way regarding the eyes of the spider coming back without that gene being present. That inherent intelligence for me is enough to feel comfortable to say there is advanced intelligence beyond this dimension. I stop there. Would you say your understanding of sacred goes further? Yes. I mean, there's a, a great deal, of course, I could say about that. I'm trying to think how to do this quickly. <laughs> um, I think I'd like to first of all say that it doesn't necessarily, I think it's helpful to put the idea of God out of one's mind to start with, which is not to say that you can't come back to it at a later stage. But I think that the problem is that it acts as a stumbling block because so many things have been said about this word that there's a good reason why in most religions it is an unword that can't be spoken of or and can't be uttered. Um, and indeed, this is not um, common, not just common to religions, but to philosophies such as that of Taoism. The, the real Tao is the Tao that cannot be named. Uh, th this idea that what it is cannot simply be put into words in the way that you exhorted me to do <laughs> um, is fundamental. And it's also uh, irrational to suppose there are things other than perhaps the word itself. How do we explain this in terms of other things if it is something that it is not part of everyday life? I, I believe it can be part of everyday life, but not of the kind of way in which we think about it generally in the West. I also think that one should try to be clear, I agree with you about that, but you may be clear only as far as it is possible to be clear. To go beyond that is to crash into oversimplification. So one needs to be very careful about the approach. And one of the things that one might be able to clarify is exactly the fact that one can't go further using the tools of science or reason. It's irrational and unscientific to say that there are no limits to reason or science. Um, I, I, to take a very down-to-earth example, one I've used before, but that of love. We can measure hormones, we can watch mating behavior, but we cannot measure love. And we can't explain to somebody who's never experienced love what it is. Um, so, uh, it, it's perfectly possible for there to be something very real that can't be measured and that can't be necessarily easily articulated, but that we're not let off the hook of trying to understand it. There's a, there's a saying in the um, Midrash, which is a, 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 a part of the Jewish um, faith, that says you are not obliged to continue, to, you're not obliged to finish the work but you are not permitted to cease striving to do so. So there are many things that we know we will never get there, but we've got to make the effort. And it's only actually in making the effort that you come to experience it. Hegel says, for example, that to understand certain things, it's like swimming. It's no good sitting on the bank and saying, well, until I've learned how to swim, I'm not going to get into the water. Because, of course, you can only swim by getting into the water and finding out. So I think that the, the whole panoply of things that you said at the outset, talking about, well, we've got to be rationalistic and we've got to be scientific and we've got to have it clarified. I'd just like to sound a note of caution. I sort of agree with you up to a point in that I don't think that one has to go dismiss science or reason or language or clarity, not at all. I use all of these and believe in them. I spent ages trying to clarify. That's why I take so long to write things. But I do also respect the fact that sometimes one has to say enough. And what you pointed to was a disposition. And I think I come back to this idea of a disposition very frequently, that what matters is our disposition to the world. And indeed, it's what distinguishes the left and right hemispheres. The left hemisphere has a disposition of control, power, and use towards the world. The right hemisphere has a disposition of openness, exploration, building connections, and building on connections with whatever it is is out there. So I would say, what, where do we contact the sacred? Not in wellness. Uh, very disappointing that nowadays the idea of the sacred is largely substituted by doing some nice exercises, having a bath with candles and all this kind of thing. But I'm sorry, that is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, what I'm talking about is not allowing or 
to be awe and wonder, to be driven out of your life. Unfortunately, the way in which people are educated now is into a vastly simplistic idea that effectively we can understand everything. In fact, there's a, there's a lecture at the Royal Society, which is done every year for, the, for children and teenagers who are interested in science. And there's one you can find on the internet. And at the outset, the speaker asks people to look at one another and to uh, think about what they are. And she says, you, you are wonderful. And why you are so wonderful is because you are very, very complicated machines. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the best that we can do to interest people in the fantastically exciting imaginative exercise of science, which is always going into new territory. Anyway, um, so it's cultivating and permitting a sense of wonder and awe rather than thinking I can pin it down with my puny argument. The second thing is an attitude of compassion so that one is not sitting in judgment on things but actually being present to them and enjoying that the experience. And the third is having an attitude of gratitude which comes with humility, really, um, being grateful for what is, seeing the astonishing nature of it and and um, being modest. Uh, well, Ian, those three things are, as you so beautifully put it, so crucial. And I have to say, I agree with you. That is very much how I reconcile the unknown and the unprovable of this instinct that we have towards the sacred with this understanding that there are things that are just so wondrous and and beyond our even beyond our conception never mind our explanation that we really need to have that humility and for me that state of humility that state of wonder is where I stop in terms of talking about the sacred because I can't say any more and I kind of I really enjoy bathing in that that sense of the unknown. And I think it is one of the scariest things for the scientifically minded. And I think it is definitely one of the scariest things for this slightly left hemisphere focused uh, culture that we find ourselves slowly transitioning out of is is this sense of my god i can't explain this and i i think that is a, a really really wonderful way to close today's uh today's interview is just to really understand that unless i think until we get used to the fact that there are things that are quite simply beyond our understanding uh, and we start to do science with that humility i wonder if if we will ever really let go of this this old uh, scientific paradigm. Do, do you mind if I just gloss something there? Oh, please, please. I was I was hoping you'd make some closing comments. No. Um, I, again, I would like to say there is no conflict, no conflict between science and the sacred. There is a book by Jerry Coyne, uh, Faith Versus Fact, Why Science and Religion Are Incompatible. Um, there are all sorts of things I could say about that, but I'm not going to now. I'd say a bit about it in my new book. But what is fantastically interesting is how many scientists uh, also find it entirely compatible with not just a sense of the sacred, but with religious faith. And in writing the book, I consulted some research which has looked at Nobel Prize winners and whether or not they call themselves atheists or agnostics at any substantial point in their career. And in those who got the Nobel Prize for Literature, it was 35%. When you looked at scientists overall, it was about 8%. And when you come to physicists, it's the lowest of all types of people, 4.7% alone thought they would have described themselves as atheists or even agnostics at any substantial point in their career. And it, the, the, what scientists, particularly physicists, who I think of as being the most philosophical scientists that we have, the, the number of them that come to the conclusion that the divine is an important element in the picture, not just consciousness, is legion. So I just wanted to, to, to clarify that in case people think they've got to give up on something they think very important. Yes. if they want to embrace those ideas yeah and we need to have the 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 
the spirit of the unknown, because that's what science is all about. It's about discovery. I think it is it is utterly uh, absurd to to let go of um, all the things we don't yet know yet. That's exactly what we're trying to trying to to work out. And yes, I think we also need to be quite humble about how much of that we're actually really realistically going to be able to do. But but it's it's also that it's also that desire to learn more that I think in itself is a very important relationship with the unknown I'll call it but but you might call that the sacred is that desire to 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 come into commune to commune with the unknown and to to take steps into it this must be part of our scientific outlook if we are to to actually really get any further than 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 we have done until now Ian, I just must say thank you so much for for your generosity with your time today. The wealth of experience and knowledge that you've built up throughout your life is so, so valuable. And to be able to share that uh, to a a wider audience, a less academic audience, I think is just brilliantly valuable. So thank you so, so much for your time. Well, thank you very much, Freddie. Um, Thank you for making such a welcoming space to talk about some very difficult things. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Speak soon.